Oh, it's so long. Go car, go, go. Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. And today I'm gonna to be talking about what happens in episode 12 of The King, Eternal Monarch. Overall, this is a really good episode following such an intense episode that was episode 11. And we got some quality unsup comedic moments as well as sweet romantic ones with the king and detective in this one. But before the very last scene, I was thinking this was a pretty basic episode. But nay nay, the writers put in a huge twist that I definitely didn't see coming at the very end. And literally the hairs are still sticking up on my arms. I'm so excited to see where this new twist goes. So now that I've teased it a bit, let's get into what happens in episode 12. We start off with Unsup in the hospital in the kingdom of Korea and him witnessing another patient drop his plate of food. He goes to help and asks if everything is all right, and the patient says he thought he saw something. We then see his doppelganger in Korea holding Song Jung Hae, or Egon's doppelganger's mother's wrist, to stop the bleeding because she's tried to kill herself once again. It seems that more doppelgangers are starting to see things going on with their other halves in the alternate universe which is very strange. When Song Jae-ho tries to kill herself, the doctor that comes in seems to be the mother of the kid we saw in one of the earlier episodes, the one where the mother was having a birthday party for her disabled child and that kid just got roasted by the kids that were invited. She's apparently the new manager who is helping to watch over Song. Right after this, we are taken to a scene where Nari is talking with Young about how she believes she's having deja vu. And she explains that this actually happens when your frequency is matching that of another world's frequency or your other half in a parallel universe kind of thing. He asks, uh, why are you telling me this? And she says, because she just saw him and her where he's wearing a hospital gown. Newsflash, it's Unsuk and she is seen through her doppelganger's eyes at what we then see in the next scene. While at the hospital, Song A comes to visit and he sees her and kind of forgets where he is for a second and thinks it's Nari and is super excited to see her. He tries to cover up his tracks and pretends to be young. What would young say in this sort of situation? And he kind of pulls it off. That whole scene was just so cute and funny. We're then taken back to the Korea universe with the scene that we had in the previous episode of the prime minister coming to Nari's coffee shop. She orders a drink and pays for it with Korean currency. And that's when Young walks in. This scene makes it a little more apparent that it does seem like it is the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister does recognize Unsup as Young. Young, of course, doesn't want her to realize it's him, so he goes into Unsup mode, but he also seems to know immediately that it's the Prime Minister and not possibly her doppelganger. After this, Young asks Nari to borrow her car and goes to follow the Prime Minister, after proving, of course, that he now has a license. We're then taken to the Korea universe where the king is heading towards the National Security Agency, being escorted by his guards and the police. This scene is what happens before we see him come to the detective's rescue and we get to see how he found her. When he arrives at the security agency, he asks that they do a wide data search to find the detective, which he provides some CCTV footage he has of her from her last visit for them to use in the search. He tells them it's urgent, but that it isn't an order, but a request, and they get to work looking for her. While there, he gets a call from Unsup telling him that the detective they've been working with in Korea, Detective Kong, has been trying to reach him about Luna and to tell him about what happened when they were chasing her down and he just has overall news about her. After this, the king goes to a quiet room where they set up a laptop for him to use and he watches the footage that the detective has sent over of what he thinks is Luna. As the king is watching, he knows immediately it's the detective 
After telling the detective that it's not Luna, but thanking him for all of his hard work, he goes back out into the main room and gives them the new information he's just discovered on where the detective's last location could be, which helps them find her quicker. Back in the Republic of Korea universe, we see that Yang is following the Prime Minister and calls the detective for backup. When she doesn't pick up, he calls Kong and tells him to meet him in Yudu and that he needs his help. Sorry if I pronounced that name wrong, I'm so sorry. Kong says yes, but that Yang owes him after this. Meanwhile, in the Kingdom of Korea, we see the head court lady who's still recovering and Kong's mother who's been taking care of her because she's still working in the palace right now. The head court lady dismisses her for the evening when the female guard arrives and we get some juicy information. Apparently, the head court lady has been having the guard keep watch on some of the people working in the palace, which she gives a list of names, and one of those names is Kong's mother, and she's been keeping track of when they changed shifts, where they went. She tells the head court lady that Kong's mother had visited a bookstore one time and hadn't said anything until now because it didn't seem like a big deal, but now it's that same bookstore that they just raided that Yi Yim was using. So now she's telling the head court lady about it because it's pretty important information now. <laughs> she shows the head court lady the photo that Kong's mother had tried to burn after leaving the bookstore. It's the photo we saw of Kong and his mother at the restaurant in Korea. This is when it's revealed that Kong's mother has been working in the palace under a fake name and the head court lady goes to confront her in the cafeteria. Kong's mother seems to know this is coming because she slips something in her food before the head court lady can get there and when the head court lady starts questioning her, she coughs up blood and collapses before she can give any answers. The staff is obviously shocked and some of them scream, but the head court lady tells them to keep quiet about this incident and asks that the police and doctor come at once. Like, this lady does not flinch. She is badass. The head court lady says that Kong's mother must stay alive so she can find out who is behind this and also who would be scary enough for this woman to take poison and die instead of being caught and talk. Uh, Yi Yim, that's freaking who. Back in the Korea universe, Yong is still chasing down the Prime Minister and using his car, runs her off the road and confronts her. As she's denying that she's the Prime Minister, even though it's obvious it's her, a car drives up and shoots at Yong and he's hit in the shoulder. And what's interesting is isn't that also where Unsup got shot? I think it was on the back but he was definitely hit in the shoulder. The Prime Minister doesn't even flinch and uses this opportunity to drive away. This is when Kong finally arrives and after checking on Yang, tells the crowd this was just a drill. Thankfully, Yang was wearing a bulletproof vest. So Kong and Yang go back to the hotel and Kong asks if he needs to go to the hospital and Yang says no, even though he's obviously in a lot of pain and bruised up. Kong tells him he deleted the dash cam footage from Nari's car and asks if this is a common occurrence in his universe and asks to give him some kind of excuse so he doesn't have to arrest him for basically causing a shootout in Korea. All Yong says is it won't happen again and he'll explain everything when the king comes back. This leads to Kong asking, well, when is the king going to come back? And instead of answering, since he doesn't know and I think he's upset about it, he throws back the coffee that Kong had just handed to him and asks him to unscrew it as his excuse for tossing it at him. He also then says that he's frustrated at the way he speaks about the king and that he shouldn't talk about him like that. And Kong's all, well, he's not my king. And Yong's like, well, uh, he used to be. This is when Kong finds out more about Yong and the king's history together, how they met when Yong was four and the king was eight, and he's been his guard and friend ever since. He's always been there for him, wants the king to smile. Kong makes a joke about asking if they're dating and Yong confirms that there have been rumors of that before. 
This is also when Kong finds out why the king was crying on TV when they were younger and how his father was killed by his half-brother and that Yigan was there when it happened. As this conversation is ending, we are taken back to the kingdom of Korea and the king is heading towards the detective with his guards, the full force of the Korea police and we see the end of the battle against Yim's men and the king and detective reunited with each other. The detective says she's going to skip the thanks and tells him how much she missed him, just crying, sobbing, Oh, She also tells him her gun has two bullets left, which he promptly shoots to signify she's safe and she doesn't need them anymore. She then collapses and the king carries her away because obviously she now knows that she's safe, so night night. <laughs> he takes her to the palace where the secretary is waiting to tell him the doctor in a guest room is ready and waiting, but the king says, no, I'm taking her to my chambers. The head court lady meets him in his room with the doctors. She frets over him a little bit when she sees all the blood until he says none of it's his, and then she kind of calms down a little bit. As the doctors treat the detective, the king stays up waiting to find out how she is outside of his room for what seems to be several hours. And when the head court lady and doctor come out later on, the head court lady asks if he's been staying there all day. When he says yes, she asks, well, why didn't you just come in? And he tells her, you told me to get out. Uh. After this, the doctor informs the king that the detective is fine and resting and is being treated for dehydration. After this, the king goes to be by the detective's side and when she wakes up, he tells her to rest more, but she asks why when she's finally back with him again. Oh. The detective tells him how she was drugged at the Taekwondo studio and the king tells her how Unsup is in the hospital. When the detective finds out about Unsup, she tells the king that she wants to visit him first thing when she's better, and the king jokes that she shouldn't talk about wanting to see other men in front of him. So they're kind of back to being their normal selves with one another. In response, she tells him Young is okay, by the way, in Korea, and he responds that he likes her more than Young, and she immediately calls him a liar, which he responds with sorry, like he got caught in the lie. And they have a little chuckle over this, which was a very sweet and kind of calming moment after all the chaos that has happened since last episode. After she kind of processes that he did say sorry when she called him a liar to him liking her more than Yang, she tells him to get out and he replies, well, no, this is, this is my room. So he won't be leaving it. And the detective says before falling asleep that uh, if this is his room, she should definitely take a look around later and see what kind of jewelry he has in there. We get a little sneak peek of what the king has. The next morning, we see a group of politicians from the Jinsun party going over what happened and the fact that the king has declared this person is the future queen of Korea. They wonder how long the prime minister is going to be ill, and they go into full research mode to find out who this person is, her background, where she's from, where she went to college, all that jazz. We are then taken to the Korea universe where Luna is at a bus or a train station getting a cell phone out of a locked locker. It's apparently the detective cell phone. Who knew? She goes to eat some fried chicken, which honestly, they've gone to this restaurant so many times in the show and that fried chicken looks so good. I kind of want fried chicken right now. She goes to eat some fried chicken and goes through the detective cell phone where we see her looking at photos of the detective and her dad, her and her co-workers, crime scene photos, which was a little like, I don't think you should have those on your cell phone, but whatever, maybe that's a thing. And also her Google search on how to grow a magic lily. As she's going through the phone, a group text pops up with the rookie uh, from the police station asking what everyone wants to eat. At the station, Kong comes in as the rookie Jungmi is texting everyone, asking them to at least respond with something so he knows they got his text. And when Kong walks in, he asks what Kong wants to eat. 
Kong is like, no, you eat without me. And that's when he asks, hey, did Teal respond to your text? This is when their boss comes in and tells Kong that Teal has actually taken her 21 vacation days all in a row. And like, why are you guys doing this to me? Kong seems suspicious of this and checks his phone to see that she has texted him back saying that she needs some fresh air as her response. He tries calling and she doesn't pick up, so he texts her back asking her, where are you and pick up my call. He's very suspicious as to what's going on here, especially now that he's in on the information, like for her to just disappear like that without telling him, kind of a big tell. We're taken back to the Coria universe where the detective is waking up to the doctor checking her. She's told, She's told by his assistant that she was to escort her to the kitchen when she wakes up. When she goes down there, she sees the staff is outside the kitchen whispering amongst themselves. She asks them, hey, uh, what's going on, what's up? And they tell her he's washing rice in his Navy uniform. <laughs> she goes to see this in person and is obviously shocked. He's smiling away, saying he just finished washing a whole bag of rice. And this is obviously a callback to the last conversation we saw that they had. And uh, obviously in this scene, she's shocked and kind of embarrassed by the whole situation and kind of closes the kitchen door as if to leave. <laughs> I think walk away from the whole situation. He yells out to her to come back since he's doing all of this for her. During this whole scene, we see that the head court lady is on the stairway and has heard everything and kind of seen what's going on between the king and the detective. The king presents the detective with a really tasty looking meal in his navy uniform. And he lets her know that he did this for her to make her laugh, even though he may have found it a little funnier than she did. She asks him how he knew it was her and not her doppelganger when he found her. And uh, he told her a few reasons why, but specifically the way she put her hair up in her ponytail in the CCTV footage, which is really freaking romantic. And also the fact that she like, you know, kicked ass. As he tells her all of this and how much he loves her, she replies that uh, she wants to go visit Unsup now. He responds that this is also a quality of hers, not his favorite, that she'll only say what she wants to talk about. So instead of telling him how she feels about him and what she likes about him, she's like, I'm ready to go see Unsup, let's go. She then asks where her clothes are and this is when the king takes her to a sort of dressing room where he's gotten some options set up for her. He tells her he's picked out some options that are definitely her style and she responds with, well, maybe I wanna wear something else, not my style. Do you have any dresses? He, of course, has dresses at the ready. <laughs> Even though she was joking, he was ready for anything that she was gonna throw at him, cause he's a genius. After she picks out her outfit for the day, she notices an outfit of the king's behind her. It's the outfit he was wearing the last time he visited her and when it wasn't the present timeline Egon. She asks what the outfit is for and he responds that it's for one of the most glorious moments. For example, when he's holding flowers in his hand. He then asks her what type of flowers she likes. This is when she starts flashing on the last time he visited wearing that outfit and giving her her favorite flowers. Thinking back to what Egon said when he was wearing that outfit and everything else, the detective says in this moment that she doesn't like flowers and asks to go see Unsuk now. As the detective is changing into her outfit, she finds a necklace in her pocket. She puts it on for a moment, kind of looks at herself in the mirror, but then takes it off and puts it back in the box. When they're leaving, the king definitely notices that she's not wearing the necklace and asks her about it. And she says she wants to wear it on a special occasion and not when she's all banged up with band-aids all over her face. She asks him how he knew she would be picking that outfit since that was the one with the box in it. And he responds with that he just knew. <laughs> Little does she know that he apparently put necklaces in all the coats of all the outfits just in case she picked that outfit, cause he's got that kind of money. They arrive at the hospital and go to visit Unsup, who's super happy to see the detective. 
The king brought him a sweet bread roll and there's a running gag in this scene about how the king won't perform physical duties like cutting the cake roll, but does suggest, hey, you want me to just buy you the cake factory? I can do that. This joke later on leads to Unsup asking the king to open the bathroom door, thinking he would offer to buy him the hospital building instead. But the king actually gets up and just opens the bathroom door, and I don't know why, but I just found that so funny. While eating the cake roll, Unsup brings up how his siblings would love this cake, and he gets a little sad and misses them. So the detective gives him an update on his siblings, that they're doing great, and that his sister has definitely figured out that Young is not him. He's also caught up on Nari and that she's mentioned that Unsup isn't as attractive as he used to be. So Unsup is very happy about that because that means that Nari doesn't like Young. After this, the detective and Kong go to the warehouse where she was being held before she escaped. And a crew is there spraying a solution to see the blood splatter and get evidence of who could have been there, you know, data. While there, the king asks her if she saw Yi Yim and if he had an umbrella with him, but she tells him she never saw him, she only saw his men. This is when the king tells her about the two flute pieces and that that's why Yi Yim had kidnapped her, to use her to trade for the king's piece of the flute since it's what allows him and Yi Yim to pass through the obelisk to the other universes. Yi Yim wants both pieces, obviously, and this leaves the detective very upset and worried since that means the king wouldn't be able to access the other universe if he loses his flute piece. He assures her he never loses what is his, and I think this is also applying to her, but I'm just probably reading into that. But anyway, he tells her that if she's really worried about it, that they should go pray together and takes her to a church. There, he tells her this is the only place that is the same in both universes, which is very interesting, and tells her about how his parents met and about his mother and how she passed away a couple years after he was born. The detective also opens up about her mother and how she passed away when she was young from cancer and how she still wears her black belt, which is really sweet. While there, a priest who works at the church appears <laughs> and the king asks him to take their photo since he won't tell anyone about them. Cause you know, loose lips sink ships, says God. Not really, God doesn't say that. When they are posing for the photo, time stops. And while this happens, we have a voiceover of the head court lady reading a poem from the book she had found in the king's jacket when he had come back from his first trip to the Republic of Korea universe. While this is being read, we see the king crying while time has stopped and quickly gathering his composure before it starts back up and they take the picture. The way I interpreted the poem and how the king starts crying is he's feeling a lot of sadness about a tough decision he's gonna have to make soon. And that decision will probably lead him to never seeing the detective again since he knows that eventually time's gonna stop forever if these gates are still open due to the flute halves. I think he's planning on closing the gates. And what does closing the gate mean? It means possibly never seeing the detective again. He could bring her to Coria and really make her his queen, but that's kind of selfish of him and who knows, the detective may not want to do that and leave her family behind forever. After that, we go back to the palace and the detective is back in the king's room and the doctor is looking over her wounds and giving her antibiotics. After this, she tells the king to leave since she's ready for bed and he reminds her that this is his room. She asks where he's been sleeping then since she's been here and he points to the other side of the bed. She smacks him from the shock of finding this out and now realizes that's why the staff has been giving her such weird looks because they've been apparently sleeping together and she didn't know it. Right at this moment, the king doubles over in pain because it starts lightning and then thundering and he tells the detective about it 
and she goes to look and see, and right then, another round of Lightning and Thunder hit, and she sees the lightning scar. We then see flashes of other people who are doppelgangers who have crossed over being hit by this same painful affliction. We haven't seen this before, so it could mean that this is a new development or maybe it's been happening the whole time, but we now know that it's not just the King and Yi Yim who are being affected by this lightning and thunder. The detective asks what it is and the king tells her he thinks it's from crossing through the obelisk and the lightning and thunder road. He then checks to see if she has it as well since she's now, since she's been passing through the obelisk. She goes to unbutton her shirt and he's like, ooh, this is getting scandalous. He looks away since it is a little naughty, but she's like, dude, just look. Like, this is not a lot of skin. This is how much I'd be showing during the summer. Like, calm down, no big deal. For some reason, the detective doesn't seem to be affected by this at all, and the king believes that the reason he's getting it is because the rules of traveling through the universes have been broken. I think it's actually because both her and Luna are still alive, and the other doppelgangers their other halves are dead. Yes, the bookstore owner was alive for a little bit. However, Yi Yim obviously had them trade places because he knew that one of them was gonna die soon. Luna and the detective are the only doppelgangers who have switched lives and are still alive. While the king is talking out his theory, the detective brings up that maybe this is where the old saying comes from. The one you say when cursing bad people out that they deserve to get hit by lightning. The king takes offense to this a little bit since he's kind of being included in this little saying, and he responds by saying he really wanted to stop beheading people. The detective, not scared by this threat, sticks out her neck and is like, yeah, go ahead, try me. And of course, uh, the king takes this opportunity to kiss her neck, which leads to kissing her mouth, which leads to them making out. And um, look at that, oh my God, scandalous. Meanwhile, in the Korea universe, we see Kong bump into someone while walking in the rain. And guess who it is? It's Yi Yim. We then see Yi Yim arrive at his house and notice a cigarette butt at the door of his office. So he goes and checks the CCTV footage and apparently Luna dropped by, broke into his house and stole some of his money. Also, did anyone else see the umbrella holder at the door? They all look the same and could they all have the, a piece of the flute in them and so he's like distributing the flute pieces even more. After this we see him eating dinner with Egon's doppelganger's mother where she bashes his head in with a vase. After he wrestles her to the ground he yells at her asking why he has these scars, why she would know, we don't know, but uh, she then asks why he won't let her die pretty much, <laughs> like why are you keeping me alive? and his response is, well, you look exactly like the king's mother. So it sounds like he's gonna use her next to get the other piece of the flute. After this, we're then taken back to the kingdom of Coria, and the pregnant woman whose husband works in the government is at a restaurant and finds out that the prime minister is there and without her guards. She pretty much invites herself to sit down with the Prime Minister and they start to chat. They start being really catty with one another and this is when the pregnant woman reveals to the Prime Minister that the King has recently announced that there is a future Queen of Korea. And obviously it's not the Prime Minister, so she's a little pissed. Back in the palace, the king is being informed that one of the men they captured, Lee Song-do, is complaining of pain when it storms. And the king is like, oh shit, uh, it's not just me. Before he could go to investigate, he's told that the prime minister has shown up to the palace unannounced. And this actually works for him because he's been needing to confront her about her leaking the news that has kept him locked up in the palace and unable to leave the kingdom. While they're talking, we get another bout of lightning and thunder and both him and the prime minister are hit with the lightning scar. So now he knows that she's been traveling through the lightning and thunder road and she knows or has been able to confirm now that he's also been going to the alternate universe. Now, this is when one of the biggest discoveries is dropped because as this is going down, the detective is having tea with the head court lady 
who apologizes to her if the detective had been feeling like she'd been mean or rude to her before. The detective, of course, understands, and this is when the head court lady asks her if she can ask her something and not to tell anyone about it afterwards. She says she's willing to trust the detective because she seems to be a government official in her own right, and she just wants to know. The detective says, yeah, uh, go ahead. She tells the detective her name is Noak Nam and gives her mother and father's name as well as her sister's, which I don't think is her actual name. She tells the detective that she was born in 1932 in Pyeongsan of Hongdae province. She left her hometown at 17 and hasn't been there since and hasn't heard news about what happened for 67 years. What she asks the detective is, what's the outcome of the war? The one that broke out in June 1950. Do you know what war she's talking about? The Korean War. The one that happened in the Korean universe that did not happen in Korea. How is that possible? How did, they, how did she cross over? Why did she cross over? Like she says that it's been 67 years and Yi Yim's only been going after the flu, devising his little plan for 27 years. So someone else in the past has used the flute to cross through the obelisk and somehow brought her back. That was definitely one way to end an episode. Before this happened, I was thinking this episode was good, but not earth shattering. But this scene changed my entire outlook of what I thought about this episode. Like they dropped that bomb right at the end. What a twist. Besides that, <laughs> this episode following the previous one, which was pretty epic and also very sad, had a good flow and I think was a very good episode to have after episode 11. The comedic relief that was Unsup. We got a lot of sweet Detective and King time, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And we did see some development on how Luna is working her way into replacing the detective. So anyway, this is obviously a very long video. I'm not sorry about it because there was a lot to cover, but I hope you enjoyed this recap of The King Eternal Monarch episode 12. Let me know in the comments below what you think about the discovery we've just had about the head court lady. Um, that it seems that she's from the Republic of Korea universe. Interesting. Anyway, can't wait for the next episode next week. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.